Welcome back everyone, I'm Jumbo Pixel, and these are my top 10 tips for new and advancing players in humankind. And my first one is actually before the game even begins. Take a look at this. And the player screen here, you can click this little button on any of your competitors to open up this screen. Head to AI Persona and you can see that each AI character has a difficulty level prescribed to them and certain benefits. This one receives a reduction to attachment cost and city merge cost, as well as plus four combat strength on military districts if units are adjacent. You can see that each AI has their own difficulty level, their own personal characteristics, and their own traits. And some of these are very, very powerful indeed. So it's worth making note of exactly who you're lining up against in your game and what kind of characteristics and benefits they might have. You can of course also change your own character's color and symbol, likewise with all the rest of them. And if you want to play against more AI characters, you can indeed create your own in the game. This is my one here. Or you can download more from the Games Together dot com website. Indeed, mine is uploaded there, so you can download me and play me if you want to. Next up, it's Unit Auto Explore. There's a little button here over in the right hand corner. Hit that and your units will auto explore. It's incredibly useful in the early game in particular because your tribes will have superhuman ability to hunt out discoveries that you otherwise may not have seen because they were indeed hidden behind the fog of war. It's a very powerful ability, but you can also use it down the line later in the game to hunt out areas of the map you might not have otherwise walked to. And of course, with your naval units as well. Remembering that by default in every game of humankind there is a continent called the New World that spawns that no player, human or AI, starts on. So there will always be a free continent out there for you to explore. So don't underestimate the power of having a naval unit on auto explore as well. It isn't just for these early game tribe units to go out and find discoveries. <laughs> Bonus tip here, by the way, your new units do have a little bit of movement on the turn that you discover them. So you can actually separate them from being together here in the same hunting party and send them out to explore in the turn that you get them. You see, I got these ones from finding that discovery and now I can send them out to explore. Next up, we need to discuss the two most important things that you need to remember when you're picking a culture. The first one is its unique trait. This thing at the top here. You can see in the case of the Harappans, it's fertile inundations, plus one food on tiles producing food already, fantastic, and plus one food on rivers. Now, this trait will stay with you for the rest of the game, regardless of how many times you change culture. Likewise with any of these. Here, if I choose this one, plus one combat strength, I will keep that forever, regardless of how many times I change my culture. The second thing to look out for is the cultural affinity that you're buying into. This little symbol here, you can hover over it when you're looking at each culture to see their affinity. You can see the Phoenicians are merchants and the, each cultural affinity has its own special thing that it can do. You can see here the affinity action is that if I was playing the Phoenicians, I could use influence to marshal venture capital towards a resource deposit, either creating an extractor or generating money. So I can use influence to create resource extraction deposits. If you hover over the Olmecs, theirs is that I can spend money promoting patriotic works of art and territories, pushing back foreign spheres of influence. So it's really worth paying attention to both of these things. This one because you keep it for the whole game and this one because it gives you a unique action to use during that period. My next suggestion comes as you roll through into the ancient era and it's to land grab fast. Spread out your units, choose the claim territory option and plonk these things down. When you're claiming a territory, it's nice to try and find a balance of food and production around 10-10 for each one, but a baseline of seven in each is reasonably good. But the point here is that you need to plop these territories down, start claiming these big chunks of land and grab as many as you can. Even if you don't intend to keep them later, if you can afford to grab them early, do so, because the AI will be just as aggressive. 
So it's really important that you start fanning out your scouts in different directions to find these territorial boundaries and spread out boundary line to boundary line. It'll be cheaper that way and it'll cost you less influence if you spread in sort of a logical flow. Start with this territory, work my way down, place a territory here, and so on and so forth down this continent. As you're exploring, of course, you'll also possibly find more discoveries, and you could be the first to discover natural wonders around the map as well, giving you some fame and edging you closer to that sweet, sweet victory condition. Next up, I want to bring your attention to these. These are humankind's neutral tribes. You can kind of think of them like barbarians from civilization, but much more advanced for two key reasons. Okay, so this is sort of a two in one, a, a double whammy. First up, when you click on them, you can see down here the patronage screen, and you can see each empire is building influence over them. You can see I'm getting plus three relation score from shared influences per turn, and I can use my influence currency or gold here to increase the amount of influence that I'm earning over them per turn. And once you get up to this top level here, this ability, Start Assimilation, will open. And when you click that button, this will instantly become one of your territories. And this, in this case it's Sus, would become one of my cities. It's really, really powerful. But in the meantime, while you're working on them, you can also click on their units. And once you get a certain civic unlocked, you can actually levy these units and immediately take control of them into your army. And you can see now in the civics tree here, now that I have uh, this Merc Independent People Civic, I've enacted Mercenary Armies, which is really great because it's given me minus 50% higher army cost. And now also, if we zoom back in onto Sus here, our old mate, you can see my influence is well ahead now. We're above this 60 range, right? This puts us at a cordial level of relations. And now, to their units, you can see the option has become available, and for a mere 13 gold, on a blitz speed game, mind you, I can rent this unit for 5 turns. 5 turns on a game where the turn limit is 75, and it's only going to cost me 13 gold to pull them into my army, and they're immediately under my control. You can see how this can get a little bit crazy. Very, very powerful army to have on call, ready to come in and reinforce any other battles. My next tip is an, another all-encompassing but really important one, and that it's that you need to know that your units count as population, and that your population within a city also counts as currency. Okay, so as you move through the game, you'll see this option here, buy out with population once you get masonry becomes unlocked, and you can buy out anything that you're constructing by expelling population from your city. So there's the first way that they act as a currency. The second way is when you first establish your faith, followers required. The first and foremost thing that you need to do, though, is have 10 population across your empire, and that includes units. So it's 10 population within your cities plus units, right? Thirdly, though, when you train a unit, it, of course, reduces this population number by one. This was eight pop. I trained this unit. Now it's a seven. But what you can also do with your units, whether you're hemorrhaging cash and you can't afford to keep them on board, or if you want to use them to transport population between cities, is then disband or expel the unit within a different territory's borders. So take a look here at this new city that has zero pop. If I click on this unit, I'll then be able to expand the unit and then return its population back to the city. You'll see all you need to do is click on the unit and that'll bring up your options down here, including other actions that you can do, by the way, like healing and upgrading and transferring. But crucially, this is the one we want. Disband units and watch as I click this. Yes. And now the city has one population. You can see it's its one farmer here. We can, of course, drag and drop him around. Here's another bonus tip for you to change what this person's job is. Are they a moneymaker? Nope, actually, they're a farmer. Another thing, actually, also, while we're here, and this is my next tip also that you can do with population. That's just sort of idling about. Say you've created a unit, but now this pop standing around, you're thinking, oh, should I just return it to the city to work again? I don't know what to do with it. 
Well, you can also click this little clear forest icon, and just like in Sid Meier's Civilization, you can walk to a forest, chop it down, and then send production to the city so that the city will build what it's building faster. And a reminder, you can see how much industry is required, how much production is required right here, uh, just over on the right hand side of the screen here. The next thing you need to know is sort of around the combat and the AI. So if you choose to manually resolve a battle like I have here, and maybe you don't quite like the odds or they're not quite playing into your favor, maybe the AI has the high ground here and you don't want to, for example, like in this case, step down onto this tile and then have them attacking down at you, which would be disadvantageous to your overall uh, position. You can always just click defend. And to be honest, it's a really great way to ride out an attack. You can see here, I'm holding the high ground and the AI will choose to attack into me rather than defend its flag. It's on the defense in this battle, yet it's willing to attack into me. Watch again here this round. I'll use my archers to fire over this mountain. But then with my unit here, even though now I have the advantageous attack, I'm still just going to defend with my scout and watch the AI attacks into me. Again, not successful. It's almost taking twice as much damage as it's receiving. Watch again, one more round, I'll defend, and one more round, it'll attack into me. This is just one small scale example. This can happen at massive scale as well, again and again. And in my testing, it doesn't matter whether I've started war on the AI and aggressively attacked them, or whether I'm defending. All you need to do is maneuver yourself into an advantageous position, right? So look for the high ground, look for the cliffs, look for the raised, especially ones like this, or mountains that you can hide behind and shoot over, right? This is the key. Get into your advantageous position geographically, and then if you're not, or once you're there, if you're prepared to, just ride it out in defense. If you're ever in doubt, just ride it out in defense. And lastly, I've got one around these, these luxury resources. Firstly, I want you to just take a look at how powerful these things are. This saffron is providing plus 12, 12 stability on all cities and plus six food on father's quarters. What? Now, also take note of the fact that there's this thing underneath called the Wanderous Effect. In this case, I must exploit at least two-thirds of deposits of this type, that's saffron deposits in the map, and research the patronage technology to be able to upgrade this resource, indeed build a district on top of one of my saffron to gain its Wanderous Effect. It basically, it's like having the monopoly of a resource. Now, that is, by itself and far away a fantastic ability. All of these different resources in humankind, like tea, like saffron, they all are fantastic. And if you can get that wondrous effect, it's even better. A little bonus tip around the wondrous effects too. If I head up to the uh, top menus up here, you can see all cities and outposts, show unclaimed wonders. It's actually my turn to claim a wonder, as luck would have it. Um, now, one that I want to in particular draw your attention to is this, the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Now you'll notice that it gives plus 20 stability, plus 1% science. That is a fantastic, a fantastic wonder, okay? But lots of these are good too, don't get me wrong. Different ones have different abilities. Let me now draw your attention to the Statue of Zeus, right? Incredible stability bonuses. What about the Pyramids of Giza? Well, in this case, there's a prereq, right? They need to be placed near a river. But the real kicker here, and the reason why it relates back to what I'm talking about and relates back to this tip is this, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, its special effect extracts any luxury resource from the deposit that it's built upon, and what it doesn't tell you is it actually extracts that luxury resource to a level where you'll have the wondrous effect. This is, after all, a world wonder. So it makes sense that it would have that effect. So if you head into your city screen, you can see it will only let you place the Hanging Gardens of Babylon on top of a luxury. In this case, I actually already have a lot of saffron, but I don't have all of the world's tea. So I'm going to place it on top of tea, and that will then, once it's completed, remembering that I can hit this button and add more cities into the production queue, once it's completed, I will have access to the wondrous benefit of tea. 
all because I took the Hankin Gardens of Babylon. Hey, thanks very much for watching. I hope you found these 10 tips useful. If you did, why not stick around the Jumbo Pixel channel here? We're a small but growing humankind and civ community and would love to have you on board. Thanks very much, everyone, and I'll see you next time.